Nice. Hey, how's it going? Um, thank you for, for having me. Um, Perseus, uh, big thanks. Mazia, Nasim, and everyone that helped uh, make this happen, which is, uh, I think it's really fantastic. Um, so, I'm going to try to make this really short. I just prepared uh, uh, talking about this project for a 45 minute talk. So, uh, I'm trying to make it as, as short as possible um, and basically uh, just talk about how this project came about. Uh, so I was in conversation with the Asian Art Museum uh, and uh, about doing something and then actually got word that the Cyrus Cylinder was coming to um, San Francisco to the Asian Art Museum. So it made a lot of sense to do something there and um, you know what we ended up doing was something which is um, became kind of you mentioned Mazier that was performative, but it was actually multidisciplinary. So uh, cylinder, cylinders, or cylinder.us kind of brings or brought together a series of happenings, including sound and multimedia compositions, literary readings, uh, an online platform which you're seeing right here. Uh, of which kind of explore time and space through the prism of the ancient Persian artifact, the Cyrus Cylinder. So, uh, you know, would someone like many of you here who has one foot uh, in this world and, and perhaps in another world, um, how do we create something that both, ha both has resonance and speaks to um, this world and perhaps the other and maybe is something even uh, bigger, can say something larger? So. My whole thing behind this project was to also look at how do ancient artifacts resonate today. So artifacts are used to make meaning contextualizing histories but also serve as vessels to hold contemporary human desires, uh, whether it's political, economic, or social. Uh, how do we essentially project these contemporary desires onto a, a, such objects uh, like the Cyrus Cylinder? And can such a kind of approach be a gateway to then consider the past, essentially? Uh, so, and whether that's, you know, uh, how the cylinder was kind of viewed in the context of uh, the Shah in 1971, or uh, President Ahmadinejad in 2008, or how we as Persian Americans um, on this most recent tour uh, see this artifact, and what does it really tell about the past, but also uh, about this kind of present moment that we're in. So. To kind of uh, sum up what, we, what, we, what I wanted to do was essentially make this bridge between the past and the present and work with young folk. And uh, in Arash's film, and, and I think Mazir mentioned this as well, there's a passage uh, which Cyrus goes on saying that I, Cyrus the Great, king of the universe, uh, and then kind of explains what he's done, what he shall do. And, and what I wanted to do is essentially ask this question to uh, students after working with them in, in a workshop. So we asked students, uh, this is Danny, who, uh, who we asked her, uh, if you were king or queen of the universe, what message would you inscribe on a cylinder like Cyrus so that would really become your legacy to come for centuries? Um, everyone is equal, treat everyone the same, treat them how you'd want to be treated. Although everybody's independent, we're pretty much the same, Treat everyone just like you. Don't be mean to people, or they'll be mean to you. Think twice before you say things, now you know what to do. Mental living is most living. Physical life is... I don't think we have time to watch all of these, but... I, John, would farm and hunt to feed the hungry people of the world. I, Maya the Great, Queen of the Universe, proclaim that I, sh I will plant all of the forests so they're really big and protect all of the animals. I, Ryan, King of the Universe, would like to come in a world with n no fighting and no war because I never want death because death just makes things worse. King of the universe. I live in a world with lots of flowers and my world is very beautiful. Everyone is equal and fair. I have my own writing. It is very swirly and curly. We have lots of technology and you use lots of buttons. The town is very big and has a lot of buildings. I'm a very good king. 
I am nice to all my people. My world has lots of water. So I, King Rashab, would make more parks, hospital, houses, museums, space and science centers, recycling plants, and all, and all that. Today, I look upon the world. People are busy finding new knowledge for ways to improve the economy and nature. Soon, we will know of things that people before us wondered and yearned about. Before me, I see people studying hard and respecting others' religions without wars and fighting, fights. Everyone has the right to sing. If I were king of the universe, I would make sure everyone had homes and could do as they wish as long as it was good and not bad. Everyone is equal. Okay, so you get the point. Uh, so there's about, uh, there's a few hundred of these actually. So, um, so kind of talking a little bit about the project that happened at the Asian Art Museum. This is something uh, that actually uh, is online. P uh, PBS, uh, I'm sorry, KQED did a little segment on this and they tweeted this and then they uh, essentially opened this up for um, educators around the country to participate and we included this on the Cylinder site uh, that you could essentially hashtag uh, do now legacy and then contribute what you would uh, essentially inscribe on this tablet. Uh, but what we did uh, when the cylinder was there uh, and Sahar was also a part of this project was, um, so just to backtrack, uh, what you're looking at is uh, an Edison wax cylinder phonograph. Uh, in 1879, right, Mazar, you mentioned that the, the Sahar cylinder was discovered. So two years prior to that, uh, Edison came up with the phonograph, the wax phonograph, uh, cylinder, which is one of the first ways people were uh, recording and playing sound. Uh, when I first saw the, the Cyrus Cylinder when I was a kid, an image of it, it actually reminded me of, I don't know if anyone's had those music boxes, and they had the little, you know what I'm saying? It was like bronze color, and it had all the, the things that, it almost feels like, uh, like those cuneiform inscriptions, right? So I always wanted to play it. I wanted to, this idea of how could you play the cylinder. And, um, I started, that kind of later on, obviously years later, uh, led me to kind of do some research on this device, uh, the, the, the Edison's, uh, you know, wax cylinder. So, you know, what we ended up doing was um, working with someone on the East Coast, uh, as well as um, to get some audio from this material that we got from all these workshops that we did working with young folk to uh, put the audio onto wax cylinders. Um, it wasn't the exact same idea. What it was, was um, one of my collaborators uh, was Atal Tikar Sot, who also happens to be my uncle. Uh, he actually did a seven, uh, essentially a seven chapter compo sound composition uh, that was made to be uh, seven channels, uh, which ended up actually being, uh, I'm sorry, seven plus the two house speakers. And what happened was that every area of this uh, location of the kind of the museum that you were, uh, it was a very different kind of sound. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little snippet of the, of the sound that was a response to uh, all this material. But we essentially responded to um, all the kind of material that was gathered from these workshops. And uh, we transformed this space, which is Samsung Hall in the Asian Art Museum, uh, <laughs> which funny enough also looks very much similar uh, to the description of uh, the gate to all nations, mm -hmm. which is in Persopolis. Uh, that's mentioned to be 25 uh, meters, if I'm not mistaken, square with four columns. Uh, the whole purpose was that it was like the first entry point to Persopolis and then you actually walk into, uh, there's other doors that lead into the Apadana Garden and other kind of halls. And it was also dim. The idea was that it, would, it was dim so that the next room that you would walk into, or the next garden you walk into, uh, makes you feel kind of in awe, right? So uh, in this space, it was also dim. We, kind of we really did transform it into what was um, conceptually looking at that idea of gate to all nations. Uh, and what was playing was uh, the same kind of materials
So this is one chapter, and again, this is seven chapters. One of the chapters um, of the sound composition was actually working with the original text. So we actually fed the original text to the computer and had both a female and a male voice uh, read the text, and then kind of made it into one. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and then we can talk maybe more about the whole concept and all that in conversation. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next um, uh, uh, panelist is uh, Sahad Driver, <coughs> who will be reflecting on the process um, of the same project. Hi. Um, before I uh, actually talk about um, uh, my, my own process engaging with this. I wanted to sh like share a little bit about what it felt like to be in that space uh, with Ella's piece. It was, uh, you're in this really big room and the, he's got, I saw in the photos, he's got this, the sound coming out of the center and around the sound there's a, a bunch of um, computer screens with uh, the, the images of these young people sort of uh, talking about their hopes and dreams and uh, it's set up so that you can walk around um, the, the center and actually the audio changes and shifts and, and, and feels, it's, it's disrupted the whole time so whatever, the angle that you're at child and a different set of dreams and you're, you're sort of hearing a different uh, set of sounds. Um, and, and in particular, something that w I found really interesting in, uh, was one of the other um, chapters of, of, of audio that he was working with that he was just describing about um, the, the sound of the original text. He had it set up so that, um, how many of you were there? You saw it, yeah. So he had it set up so that that original text um, sounded like a computer, like very automated and almost lifeless. And, um, and, uh, and then the, that juxtaposed to the incredible uh, other sounds and, and, the, and the sounds of these kids was a really interesting um, dynamic for me uh, and something that I found really inspiring, not just in the space there, but actually in the lead up to um, the conversations that I had uh, both with Aggie uh, about her own engagement with her own project and uh, the three of us talked as well. So I was not only engaging with my own experience of the Cyrus Cylinder uh, and, and its legacy in my life, but I was also engaging with the artistic process that they were both in uh, and what they were thinking about. So that is, um, so I guess like what I ended up um, with was a, 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 a piece of writing that um, Ella asked me to write that was uh, a response to both the cylinder and, and this art project in, in a way, and, and I'll read you five minutes uh, of it in a second, but um, I wanted to, before I do, to kind of explain, I think, uh, 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 that, uh, the reason I pointed out that tension is that uh, there is a, a tension that I have felt in my own life around um, this, not just the cylinder, but a lot of sort of the grandiose stories that uh, I grew up with, you know, uh, about Iran and, and uh, the Persian Empire and the Persian civilization, which was both uh, something that I, I have gained a lot of pride in and, and feel very invested in, in many ways. Um, and, uh, and, and also, uh, uh, it's a complicated set of feelings because uh, there, there are ways that I think as a, as a community we, we can uh, uh, we can stand to grow a little bit in terms of uh, recognizing uh, certain certain ways that by borrowing uh, a discourse like uh, appealing to the civilizational sort of grandiosity of the Persian Empire, there were also um, sometimes uh, I think by accepting that stepping on the backs of others. Um, who I mean, who is the other that were um, that were separating ourselves out from? Who are we saying we're not? Uh, when we do that and um, and that's something that uh, it's a complicated uh, uh, terrain for me that um, is I think part of what I was exploring and in particular the question prompt that Allah had what would you do what would you want your legacy to be if you were a uh, king or queen of, of the universe um, it's already s imbued with such grandiosity you know like as if a person could be king or queen of the universe uh, and, and and what are we saying when we're uh, when we're giving uh, freedom to another. Uh, so I wanted to juxtapose that. Uh, I, I thought, like, what would it be like to, to play with uh, the stories of individuals and people who might 
die in history uh, or you might never have heard of or that you have heard of but n might not place in the same sort of uh, king or queen of the universe, I give you the freedoms that you want, sort of a space. I wanted to sort of play with what that would feel like. So I'll read you um, five minutes of what I wrote and then we can all talk. In 2006, a cadre of the French hacker artist underground collective, Urban Experiment, set out to restore the Pantheon's 19th century clock, which had not rang out in over 30 years. They worked hidden from view, moving quietly under the streets of Paris like rats through a series of underground passageways, catacombs, and sewers, broke into the grand building from below, and spent months in a secret workshop quietly resuscitating the beating, beating heart of this comatose city. Woke it from its slumber for the first time, tick tock since the world saw African independence, Vietnam, the student movements, black power and the walk from Selma to Montgomery, the Stonewall riots, Apollo 11, the eight track, Motown and Woodstock. Dignity and purpose, two hands on a clock, rotate around a, signal, a single axis. And it rang loud, the reverb pulsing beyond the city's limits to caress the cheek of a fearful mother in Pyramid Lake, to wipe the tears of a suicidal soldier in Fallujah, to stir the passions of a generation just waiting for its time in Tehran, Tunisia, Yemen, Bahrain, Libya, Syria, Egypt. The echo resounding as far as Greece, Brazil, the United States. That year, snow fell in Argentina for the first time in almost a century. But some feared the tremble of this newly pumping blood. The Pantheon's director, anxious at the uncertainty of this quantum kiss, hired a clockmaker to restore our beating heart to its broken state left to whimper softly as a dying horse. Its hands remain frozen at 1051. I would have the old rebel spirit that runs through these romantics remembered. The universe is a very big place. In fact, it's expanding, speeding up at its edges and furthering the distance between bodies, longing for each other like lovers. But we have always been a defiant and curious kind. Seeking the edge of the world, we traveled across oceans and massive ships, across lands on horseback, camelback, with bicycles, in automobiles, trains, then planes, space sh shuttles, and stations. And when our bodies kept us earthbound, we built satellites, interstellar telescopes, and massive tunnels so we could look further into the past than ever before, so close to creation we could see it brewing in the distance. At this very moment, we are tearing through space, starlight, nothing less than history, betrays itself. The far edges of an explosion racing to reach us. When it does, it will be nothing but fossil light, they say, neither here nor there. The ultimate riddle. This is why the sky is black. Black is home to the coming light, forever arriving. I wonder, Maman Bozurg, when I catch your reflection in a window and turn to find I am alone, if it is the pluck and drive of a defiant and curious kind, racing time to touch for a moment the one she loves. In those schizophrenic days, a sentimentality surfed over the sinkholes of our compassion, and we lost more of our brothers and sisters to suicide than war. We wondered why we felt so alone. We tried to forget. We tapped the veins of the earth like a crack addict and pumped oil, oil to motor toys and soothe our penetrating sorrow. We remembered the old stories, of great and powerful men who wielded swords, taking much, giving little. We did the same. We ran out of oil, so we made gunpowder, tanks, and missiles. We stole from each other, wondered at the hollow, hollow ring fading flat in our chests. We tried again. We built networks, grids, interwebs, and military, industrial, techno, corporate, media, proto, digital, nanobiotic complexes. We got caught. Millions of us were forced from our homes of generations to go hungry in shanty towns to make way for dams that would power the homes of a future belonging to only some. We grew companies so powerful they could own our ideas before we even had them. We watched violence on screens for pleasure. We were taught to fear friends, to hurt our loved ones. We longed for each other through pixels and code. We ached for touch. When we lost our sons and daughters, fathers and mothers, believing freedom was a thing that could be possessed, our leaders told us to go shopping. We did. Those of us with the most became suspicious of our neighbors and we clutched our possessions tighter to our chests. Those of us with the least grew desperate, knowing freedom and dignity to matter more than life. Many were forced into cages for yielding to them, clawing and tearing like animals at our insides. We changed the rules. 
in Vietnam, at Bretton Woods, Hiroshima. Some of us welcome the cameras on every corner, the drones overhead, the bugs in our phones, because we believe the laws were meant to protect us. Those of us who sat in high-tech prisons refusing food, San Quentin, Pelican Bay, Corcoran, had a different story to tell, one of fossil light. Those of us in Evin, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, grew stronger with the pulse of their beating hearts. Tick, tock, I would have them remembered. With stitched brow, we wrung our hands. Our hearts raced with guilt, fear, shame. We shared anxious whispers with our friends. We followed the rules. We signed petitions. We made phone calls. We turned off the news. We felt the changes occurring to the colors of the morning sky, to the stench in the air and the burn of sun on our skins. We cried when finally a black man was voted into the presidency. We felt something again. We danced in the streets. We shook hands. We passed friendly words. We believed that, yes, we could. And when he drew us nearer to war, we hung our heads. Insanity, we've been told, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We tried something new. A woman who finally escaped from her enslavement in 1849 taught us something of freedom. The taste of the Philadelphia morning dew on her tongue grew stale and festered. So she turned around and went back for her family weeks later, recognizing that if there is one among us who is not free, then not one of us is free. By the time of her death in 1913, Harriet Tubman had led well over 700 people to the free states, traveling by night and guided by nothing but the North Star. She was plagued by dizzy spells and bouts of intense pain in her head throughout her life, the result of a severe beating when she was young. Later, when she underwent surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital, she refused anesthesia and preferred to bite down on a bullet instead, just as the, uh, just as the soldiers she loved had been forced to do. I would have her brave heart remembered. And, and the uh, last uh, panelist is uh, Nasreen Rahimi. Uh, and the way it's going to go, Nasreen is going to give her commentary, and then we're going to open it, open it to the discussion. Please. Thank you. Um, I'll just take a minute because I wanted to thank Pisces. Um, I'm Shaheen. Uh, San Jose State University. Yesterday I had the fortune of un um, understanding a little bit more about the program, getting to know it better, and I applaud their work. They have literally, as the Dean said, created something out of nothing with a lot of effort. And I hope the members of the community here will support them because this is a fledgling program that needs your support. Okay, that was the ad. <laughs> So I thank you all and thank Percy's for always collaborating with us uh, at the Samuel Jordan Center. This is the way in which we can flourish um, and have many such programs and centers. My interest in the Cyrus uh, Cylinder um, is uh, really dubious and I have an ambivalence that I've had ever since uh, as, a, as a youngster I um, watched the 2500 years celeb of, what was it, 2500 anniversary of the foundation of Iranian Empire uh, in Iran. I, ca I can never say it in English because it's like it's inscribed in Persian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. They, everybody knows. But anyway, um, but I watched all of this in, on television, of course, and, uh, and I remember the disjuncture between what was happening on the TV screens and what was happening around me. I was not that aware or, you know, politically conscious, I could say that at this moment. But what, uh, coming from the north of Iran, in, from a Gilani family that uh, was, had a, a long history of being involved in t the two-day party, you know, thinking themselves intellectuals, not necessarily, I don't want to glorify this because they, it, they were sort of, like they just believed in it because everybody believed in it. But the, the sense of, um, 
glory that was projected on the screen and we were seeing the Shah, particularly that invocation, the Shah's invocation of Cyrus uh, was, well, to some extent there was a sense of awe and as a youngster I could feel it um, and I wanted to almost feel it but then there was my father, my uncles and you know my aunts, everybody just deriding all of this and going, Ugh, look at that lunatic, here he goes again, the megalomaniac and that sort of was representative of what was a sense that pervading Iran and yet we were watching on the screen this glory that was supposed to be the projection of contemporary Iran. And then as we watched the processions uh, of the armies, the Persian armies across time and so on, it, and I became more interested in um, my father or somebody of always offering some commentary on how much money was spent on bringing fake beards, importing fa fake beards for these things. So it became a kind of a comedy and yet the Shah was clearly himself moved, deeply moved and he had bought this whole thing lock, stock and barrel. And so that disjuncture and then here I am, I arrive in California in 2006 and the very first person who comes to, well I arrived to to uh, run this Center for Persian Studies, Iranian Studies, and the very first Iranian who, Iranian American who walked into my office um, had this to present to me. How about the community giving the Samuel Jordan Center a gift of a replica of Cyrus the Great, a life-size, you know, replica of Cyrus the Great <laughs> to display right outside our uh, center. I, was, I thought first it was a joke, but it was real. They had collected a million dollars for that statue project. And I really didn't know what to do. I was astounded. Um, and the more I thought about this, and the more I became familiar with, in the classroom, the Iranian Americans who had grown up with um, what was handed down to them f in their families, uh, was that we are the sons and daughters of Cyrus the Great. Not every single student, but I had a, the experience of being confronted in my classrooms occasionally um, with those myths. And these were Iranian Americans born here in California, by and large. So I was a little worried about what we were doing as a community as a young community uh, in, in the US, how are we passing down culture? And what does culture mean anyway? And so one of the uh, best experiences I had, the most educational for me, was that I was teaching a course on Iranian cinema um, and poetry, the link between poetry and cinema. It, and we saw a lot of wonderful Iranian films, post-revolutionary Iranian films. One of my students came to me and the students had the option of each choosing a film and bringing it to show to the class that we could discuss together. This very young uh, woman, brilliant woman, came up to me after class and was very, very worried, hand wringing and so on. And she said, you know, I have a professor, can I ask you for something? I said, yes. I said, for the f can I present a different kind of film for my part? And I said, oh, certainly, it's your choice. And she, s she said, okay. And I said, well, are you going to tell me what it is? He said, well, you know, my father, I've been telling my father what films we were watching, and he said that you should tell your professor that this is not the right way to represent Iran. <laughs> and all these uh, religious people and mm, a representation, or the, the culture that you see in contemporary Iran, that's not what Iran is, so you really should go and tell her that there are other ways of seeing it. I said, okay, good, fine, you know, whatever, bring something. And then I thought, well, great, that leads to discussion. So she brought to the next class the, a, a very short kind of clip of the propaganda voiceover for the, the Shah's, the Muhammad Reza Shah's coronation. So, and I thought, oh my God, here we go again. I seem to never be able to get, liberate myself from that moment. But edu it was educational for me because I had no idea how to then present it to the class, so I asked her to present it. 
And she presented it, she showed it, it was very short, um, and presented it and said, you see, I wanted to show this so that you would see what Iran really is. We have not always been poor, we have not always been so uneducated and backward, and literally her words. And I was, oh, oh, what are we going to do? Well, we had seen early on in the course Furo Farrokhzad's Khane Siyahas, The House is Black. Well, I, before I could even have a pause to think what I'm going to say, one of the students herself, Iranian-American, said, you know, were the dates close to the, when Farrokhzad made that film? And so then the class exploded because they said, well, if this was the Iran that was the real Iran, what about where did Furo Farrokhzad find these lepers who were behind closed doors? Anyway, to, to tell you that gradually I became uh, more conscious of ways of working with our youngsters in the community. And so when the Cyrus Cylinder was coming, touring, I felt as if I was frozen in time again. I felt uh, in a very strange way, as the director of the Persian Center, disempowered. I felt like, <laughs> we're back there. We can't say anything but be to say, we, before anybody thought of human rights, anachronistically, we did it. You know, we were the inventors of everything from hamburger to human rights <laughs> to Hormisavzi. You know, this is where I felt so frustrated. So when the occasion came up and Maziar had last year brought some artists, Maziar and Tarane had come to our center, um, and Maziar brought it up, uh, that we could discuss with Persis the possibility of doing something around this. I was very enthusiastic and I am really grateful to the artists who have given me different ways to think about this and to see also that we're not frozen in time. This artifact of the past is a way for us. It's a bridge, as to, to borrow from Allah, it's a bridge for us, but it's a bridge about, uh, a bridge to a dynamic sense of culture. Nothing is frozen, nothing, nothing is static, and that in the uh, invocation of it, we can recreate it. So, thank you. Um, yeah, we have actually, uh, you know, more than, how much do we have, like 30 minutes? Yeah, yeah, we have 30 minutes. Just a, c a couple of uh, things that I was going to add. Uh, that my impression of of the pieces here, um, they're, they're really fascinating. You see, what this is what happens when when uh, you have different artists working and exploring different aspects. Uh, for me, um, uh, the impression that I got from Aggie's uh, work uh, and working with archive the question of um, both visually and, um, and, 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 and it, more than visually what is in the background is what is in the, what is in the da retrieved data. How, do you re how can you represent it? Not only how can you represent it, how can you, um, with your senses, how can you make, make, create meaning out of it? Uh, I think it, it was really uh, wonderfully uh, displayed and, and uh, worked on. Um, and um, and um, it, it, Arash's work also, um, I, mean, I like the point of the Aggies the working with the shredder and uh, Iranian uh, U.S. Embassy in Iran, the shredder and, 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 and the archaeological data. This is, uh, this is just fantastic. Uh, and Arash's work actually sort of takes it to another uh, le poetic level of expression, uh, working with um, not only our understanding is uh, kind of circumscribed by, by, um, by, by our senses in a moment, uh, but also topological, where, where you are, where this is presented, uh, and, and how wonderfully this can bring into one place by, by someone, by one person who can actually, um, uh, who can explore the, the personal meaning to, to that and observations. Um, I, I also think that, um, so when we move to Alos project, uh, 
I, I agree with Alan. This is not only performative, this is just a multi-sensory, but in my language of performance, it would be different from your language of performance, which is kind of interesting in, in of itself. Uh, but that, the question of uh, the imaginary, imaginary through different kind of technological uh, processes, um, uh, and, um, and how they can actually work together, uh, how, how these things are mediated. Uh, it's just really at, at its basis, this is, this is wonderfully, I think, uh, explored um, yet in another uh, instance. And, and uh, Sahar's uh, uh, performance in this uh, is kind of a, for me, it's a kind of a debunking of the genius uh, through all these kind of uh, critique of the, of the genius through uh, her own um, discursive engagement with it. Uh, so I, I kind of thought the, I should just share my, exp uh, my uh, expression, my, my impression of this whole project and see how it, important that could be. And, and with that, I just want to open it uh, to discussion. And please feel free to ask questions from specific artists or you want to just ask a, qu a general question or we just take it. Go ahead. Yeah, please, um, please come here. I, there is actually the microphone probably works. Yes, it does work. I have a question for Nasrin. I'm just curious about the films that you were talking about that you were, that, uh, were screening and then there was an issue with it. Right. The, uh, the, the films for the class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there were really the films um, we started with House is Black, The House yeah. is Black. And then um, because I was working with the concept of poetic cinema, how right. poetry, how much poetry comes into Iranian cinema, post-Iranian cinema, then um, 
and then we worked with May Lady uh, because there's a kind of poetic recitation mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, oh, Kiara Slami's uh, Bad Mara Khahad Board. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so those were the films. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you think about them, uh, it there was really nothing, uh, or I couldn't think of those films as having uh, been uh, put downs of Iranians or a bad representation of Iranians. But I, th I realized that, and I remembered how many Iranians in Canada, where I lived for many years, also reacted to um, the films that came out of post-revolutionary Iran. Because they would say, oh God, we were civilized. We did not, we don't, it's been years since we ate on the floor. You know, so there's this anxiety. I realize it, it is an anxiety about, so there are levels, different levels of anxiety about, we're not part of the Islamic Republic, we are really civilized, we're not hostage takers, but there's also this anxiety about that rural Iran is not where I am from. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think that's yeah. what it was there. Something I find, oh good. No, no, please. Well, just something to follow up on that that I find interesting is that oftentimes that comes out of a, um, that, that need to, to show ourselves as different from is comes out of a need um, to re-represent ourselves, right? Because there are all these stories told about us. Yes. But then often what happens in that process is that we then start crafting stories that we tell about ourselves that, as Sahar mentioned, are, are sort of exclusionary in a lot of ways. And I think what, what young art, artists are doing in diaspora is really interesting because I think they're trying to um, make more inclusionary the stories we tell about ourselves. Yeah, because it, it isn't altogether elsewhere. I mean, yeah. uh, Edward Stey talks about exile at, and the impact of exile on the imagination. And, and Joseph Brodsky talks about how exilic communities isn't altogether elsewhere. And I think when I was growing up, it was very much, um, you know, there were these stories. There were these stories of that, that Persia, of the mythic past. Uh, that was somehow kind of uh, juxtaposed by imagery from the Iran-Iraq war on the TV. Mm -hmm. And where is reality, where is the real, you know, like, so I had developed this kind of imaginary Iran mm -hmm. in my head. And it wasn't until I went back uh, when I was 18 that I went to study there for, for a little while. So I, I read, sorry, it's actually neither this or that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for folks who grew up here, and especially talking about the diaspora, uh, it, we're from a generation, folks that grew up here, that um, that first impression of Iran for the non-Iranians was the Iran hostage situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're growing up and you're like five years old, six years old, seven years old, and people are like, oh, I saw your people on TV, mm -hmm. you have to do all this, you have to put a lot of effort and energy to try to create a, a new image of what that is. So if it means pushing it towards an area where it's, it's, it is more fictional, if it's more myth, it is like, no, we come from kings. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. So the next, and then that's why I asked about the, uh, the movie was, uh, you know, the, the next kind of introduction to Iran were these movies that came out with, ki you know, and, and this is with all due respect, because I'm, I'm a big fan of Kiara Stami, Mahmoud Rauf, um, Beza, but films of young kids yeah. running barefoot in the desert uh, with no shoes. That's all great. And I understand it, it, it introduced a more humanitarian kind of, uh, kind of angle to our culture. But for a kid that was also growing up here, it's problematic in that sense. Because we're also trying to like rip, you know, have a different, uh, portray a different uh, image of Iran. So I think there's a lot of issues when it comes to diaspora and how we represent. And I think it's a big question of always trying to kind of represent, um, which I think is a big fact. I mean, it's a big thing to, to talk about. Just, yes, go ahead. Um, so I really appreciated the film, especially I Need Your Thank you. Uh, I'll be louder, please. Yes, you come here. I said I really appreciated the films, especially Aggies. Um, Aggies. Um, so I was waiting for somebody on the panel to talk about the organizations that supported the project in the United States mm -hmm. and the organizations that promoted it. Um, and I'm surprised that that particular political context never, maybe I'm not surprised, I don't know, but I, I, I was waiting for the political context to come up because this project emerged not just out of an Iranian monarchical political project, but also out of the very American, Iranian-American political project. Um, and from what I know, 
there was, a, there was dissent amongst our community's organizations about this project. They disagreed about this project. Um, so I don't know if anybody can or would be able to speak to that. Actually, I, I'm sorry that my colleague Tiraj Daria is not here because he probably experienced that most uh, up close. The only thing I know is that the, uh, the representation that I got, because I was never involved in that planning and didn't see it, is that the Farhang Foundation a foundation created by affluent Iranian Americans in Southern California um, supported this and made it into that year's project. But um, I, I don't know if what other groups were involved, so my knowledge is just limited to that. And as that I heard about it is that it was great, they were all been behind it. But